it's a pleasure to be here again. I'm here in Arlington speaking to all of you. So our next panel is Cancel Culture, Social Movements and Political Campaigns. And we have, I see two, uh, three presenters here. And Philip and Jenny, I don't see yet, but hopefully they can join us later. So the first presentation is a uh, um, discussion of late Night Political Humor, Cancel Culture in the 2020 Presidential Campaign by Steve Farnsworth and Farrell Latif. I see them here. I don't see Bob and the rest of the team, but maybe they can join you later. So you may go ahead and share your screen. So I'll start now if that's all right. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, this is a collaborative effort involving a, a number of people at a number of Washington area universities. Um, uh, Farah is is here with me today. Uh, Bob sends his regrets, um, and uh, the you know the the other students are are getting ready for midterm. So um, if uh, if uh, you uh, um, have comments, Farah, after I finish, by all means, add them. Um, just a, a general uh, observation that I would make. Uh, what we have here is part of a longer running project involving the study of political humor as it relates particularly to presidential candidates and presidents. Uh, we have a, um, a book out that, uh, that deals with this question leading up to um, the first year of the Trump presidency, Late Night with Trump, that looks at the 2016 campaign and the, the 27 presidency. But as we all know, there's so much more to the Trump presidency than the opening acts of that presidency. Um, the um, when we think about late night comedy and um, cancel culture, I think it's important to recognize that there is clearly a, a mixed feeling here on the part of these humorists. It's clear that Donald Trump has been an extraordinary advantage for them in terms of giving them a lot of material to work with, both who he is, what he says. Uh, these sorts of things are rich, rich veins for political humor. But it's also true that they did everything they could to undermine his reelection prospects. Uh, there was no stone unturned when it came to mockery of Donald Trump. Uh, but um, but his, his, uh, his existence in the political world uh, and his years as president uh, was an extraordinarily beneficial environment. So make no mistake about it. There are mixed feelings here. Uh, lots of opportunity to mock um, and lots of gratitude that he was there in such a mockable fashion. One other thing to remember that with Trump's dedicated following and his media skills, he's never really going to be canceled no matter what happens on late night. Um, it's, a, um, it's an opportunity uh, that will last beyond the Trump presidency. He may not be president now, but he remains still uh, in public life and remains as a result a, a rich opportunity for mockery. I think that, um, that he still uh, is a very, very dominant role in terms of the, the late night political humor. Now, this goes beyond this paper, which looks at the 2020 presidential campaign, but the data we've collected so far on 2021, uh, the first uh, months of the Biden presidency suggest that it's still very much a Trump conversation with these late night humorists. Um, now, uh, why are we studying it and why does it matter? Um, I think the important thing to appreciate about political humor is that this has increasingly become a source of political information, particularly for young adults. Uh, for people who are not naturally oriented to politics and who don't really focus on politics, this can be sort of a, uh, a gateway, if you will, to, uh, to further understanding of political uh, humor uh, might lead to further understanding of uh, political news itself. You see, um, a story, uh, a joke about Mitch McConnell isn't very funny unless you know who Mitch McConnell is and you know something about what he does. And so that really is a dynamic where we can see that political humor um, and public opinion shows uh, results show us that that does lead to greater uh, news consumption, um, increased political knowledge as well. So, so there is this pattern here. Now, in uh, our previous work, um, we found that Republicans are much more likely to be targets than Democrats in presidential election cycle. And we know that going back to 2016, that Trump did set the record for um, attention for political humorists. Um, the data that we have here uh, involves the nomination period and the general election period of the campaign of, of 2020. Um, all, all told, we have um, uh, 3,300 political jokes relating to the nomination period 
and we looked at uh, 1,688 political jokes during the general election period. Um, we looked at four separate uh, nightly shows, um, and then we also did a qualitative analysis of once a week programs that, um, that we think were important for the conversation, but they do not necessarily give us the same, um, the same opportunity for the coding of jokes. They don't have that kind of run and gun, you know, set up joke dynamic that you see on Fallon and Colbert, Kimmel and Noah. And so we have to look at them a bit differently. Uh, we should note that as you look at this, that <coughs> there is a very distinct um, difference between this election cycle and our analysis and previous election cycles. And that is uh, because of time and money restraints, uh, we haven't been able to, we haven't been able to code the entire year. And so when we get to the comparative study, um, it'll be important to note that uh, we are looking at a, at a half, give or take, the, uh, the number of days of analysis that you see in previous years at this point. But uh, for the moment, we'll, we'll put that aside. Um, what you see is that it really is all, all Trump all the time. Uh, during the nomination period, um, even though there was a very competitive uh, Democratic contest going on, um, there is a, um, a, an opportunity to really look at this dynamic in a, uh, in a very Trump-focused way. Um, and by the way, I, I've, I've, I've sent the, the slides to Surge, and so um, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, so it's, they're available if you want to email me or email, email him. Um, the, um, the issue here, of course, is that no matter how much the Democrats were fighting over who should be the nominee, uh, the reality is that, uh, that the conversation was almost entirely about Trump. And I would say that um, that, that, um, that that Democratic race, I want to say a little bit about it, um, even though the, the real story, of course, remains Trump, um, there, is a, there is a challenge, I think, on the part of late night comedy in terms of figuring out what to do with Joe Biden. Um, first, um, he, he, of course, didn't do that well in the early caucuses and primaries, and so there was a possibility he wouldn't be president. So there wasn't a lot of attention paid to him at first. But when, once they did focus a bit more on Biden, when it became clear that he was the likely nominee, uh, it, became, uh, it became difficult. They, Saturday Night Live went through a whole series of people trying to play Biden. Uh, none of them were all that successful. Um, and they're still, I think, struggling with how to present Biden. Uh, like the coverage of Trump, the coverage of the Democratic field is very much focused on who they are as people. And so the Biden jokes were largely about him being old. Um, the Sanders jokes were often about him being kind of this wild man and sort of uninhibited figure. And the reality is that uninhibited figures are great sources for comedy because they aren't coloring between the lines. I think that one of the problems with making a joke about Joe Biden is that he is such an establishment figure that he isn't far enough away from the herd to really demonstrate the kind of opportunity for humor that you see when you're looking at other uh, political figures. And then others sort of had their own dynamics. I think uh, Bloomberg um, was kind of a, a vanity campaign. He spent a lot of money, got almost no votes. Uh, and so there was a lot of opportunity to laugh about that gap between uh, what the expectations might be and the results. Um, Bloomberg and Buttigieg uh, in particular, I think really, really underperformed compared to what Washington media consensus was and, uh, and make no mistake about it, political humor often is going to be drawn from the content or the framework established by conventional news outlets. Um, that's what people are seeing. That's what the writers are seeing. That's what the comics are riffing on uh, in part because it's more familiar. Uh, there are the occasional jokes about people who aren't running for president, um, but by and large, and of course, this is just the people who had five or more jokes on those four shows, uh, you, you really do see a, a focus within the Democratic field that, uh, that really pretty closely matches their polling numbers. Um, people further back in the pack, like Warren and, and Steyer and Klobuchar and Booker, um, they don't get nearly the attention that, say, Sanders and Biden did. Uh, Bloomberg, um, they they found a particularly uh, mockable once again because um, there is a um, a dynamic in uh, in humor generally that involves um, punching up, and so someone who is a billionaire is going to be a very appealing target uh, than say um, the dynamic of a um, of a punching down kind of environment. Um, I, you know, I think that this is one of the reasons why these shows are disproportionately liberal. 
Um, you have a reality that, you, you know, the kind of things that conservatives often talk about uh, do not lend themselves to humor. I mean, right now, Fox News is trying to run a late night comedy show. Um, but if you ask me, jokes about people huddled at the border or homeless or suffering from one affliction or another do not make the same kind of targets, effective targets for humor that, say, a captain of industry would. And that reality, I think, um, really creates a difficult environment for conservative humor because um, humor uh, does work best when it's punching up, the punching down that you see uh, sometimes on, on some of the late night shows on conservative uh, media or cons the conservative environment doesn't work very well. I think the conservative vehicle much more effectively is outrage. And so when you, know, you talk about how uh, the world is going to hell, um, then you can get an audience for that. And that's why talk radio is much more a conservative uh, vehicle uh, than, uh, than, uh, than late night comedy for conservatives. I think that's why um, the cable shows are, have oftentimes higher audiences when uh, they use the, the outrage of the, the afflicted right. Um, when, when we have different, of course, about the 2020 cycle was the nature of the, uh, of the uh, environment of 2020 when you had um, issues of COVID. Uh, that changes um, all kinds of dynamics. Um, you also had the uh, first Trump impeachment during this period of time. And what you see when you're looking at these individual uh, shows is the same pattern that we've seen in the past. Uh, once upon a time, the, the Tonight Show was the dominant uh, television late night program. Um, Johnny Carson's very even-handed approach to making fun of people on the left and the right, I think really gave middle America exactly what they wanted. Uh, but increasingly, you've seen a movement in political humor that really creates this sort of bifurcated environment. And, um, and uh, Fallon and NBC have really taken the decision not to be as politically oriented as the other shows. And uh, by a variety of measures, we can see that they don't have nearly the, uh, the focus on Trump. They don't have nearly the focus on, uh, on some of the key issues of the time um, compared uh, to uh, particularly to the other shows. Um, now, during the, the general election period, we had to shrink our, our study a little bit further. We just now are looking at the, um, the two shows uh, of, of Kimmel, I mean, of, of, of Fallon and Colbert. Um, these were the two, two sort of polar differences. Uh, Colbert is one of the most in, intensely uh, anti-Trump voices on, on uh, late night. Um, and so um, we see, um, once again, uh, a story that's basically all Trump. This, by the way, is the most one-sided. Uh, coverage uh, in terms of political humor uh, that you, we have seen uh, across the, uh, the years that we've looked at this. Um, and, um, and so this is the, the comparison that I wanted to give you a sense of what's, what we see here. Um, as I mentioned, every year that we've studied, going back to 1992, every presidential cycle, um, the Republicans have gotten more humor directed at them than the Democrats. Um, but if you look at the uh, trajectory over time, you can see that the gap has gotten much, much bigger um, over the last few election cycles. Um, when uh, in the 1990s, Bill Clinton offered up certain uh, opportunities for late night humor, particularly with his personal life, um, the, the numbers were pretty closer, pretty quite a bit closer than they are more recently. Um, as you can see, Trump set the record in 2016 when he had 70% of the humor directed at 78%. Uh, of the humor directed at the two candidates. Uh, when you're looking at Trump um, in 2020, and that's 96 to, to, to four, um, we have a partial year here um, in 2016 and 2020. Um, as I mentioned, we've been reducing the numbers here uh, because of the need to reduce the, um, the number of days that we're analyzing. But even with our slim down environment, we're looking at, um, at uh, like I said, about half a year in 2020 instead of the entire year and all the other years, except we went only through the uh, election cycle in 2016. Um, and even with that partial year, we still see dramatically more political jokes at the presidential campaign than in previous cycles. And so what you see is a greater and greater intensity of focus on presidential candidates, but also on, um, on, the, uh, on the, um, the, uh, the Republican side as well. So you know, when, you, when you put this all together, um, I know we have some other panelists, and so I want to want to wrap things up here. Um, it's pretty clear that that Donald Trump was in a, a class by himself. 
Um, always first in the number of jokes, regardless of the circumstances. Um, and that really puts him uh, head and shoulders above every other uh, candidate for president that we've looked at going back to the 1990s. Um, we didn't study this. We didn't start studying this until the 1990s. But if you go back further, uh, further in time, um, there was far less political humor at that time. There was, you know, when Johnny Carson made a political joke, he would only make a few of them a night. It was nothing like the Gatling gun nature of political humor uh, today. Um, it was easier uh, for the when, when we think about the nomination process for the uh, the comics to make fun of Bernie Sanders. Um, in part because he was somewhat uninhibited. He had this kind of loud, boisterous demeanor that, that allowed people to, um, to draw more attention to him. I think, you know, more a button down straight lace candidate like Joe Biden didn't really, uh, didn't really offer the sort of rich vein of humor that, uh, that Bernie Sanders or of course Donald Trump did. Um, while I haven't talked too much about the, the once a week comedy programs, um, they had similar patterns, uh, really very much of a Trump focus. Um, and uh, little attention to the Democratic field. When they did talk about the Democratic field, uh, Bernie also got a lot of their attention. Um, and, um, and again, you, you see a, a dynamic um, of political humor that really creates exaggerated descriptions of who people were. You know, whether it's the, you know, the intense policy wonk of Elizabeth Warren or the, the, the not all that liberal billionaire, Michael Bloomberg, you just see this real dynamic of taking someone and creating kind of a funhouse mirror version of who they are. Um, and one of the reasons why I think political humor is as appealing as it is, is because it does offer sort of a, an easier way to think about politics and to orient oneself to politics. But um, that we as we think about this environment, it really is a place where you can can offer up kind of a spoonful of sugar that, that might let the, the medicine of politics and political news uh, go down a bit easier. Um, it's also, of course, an opportunity for the, um, uh, the, uh, the traditional media to, to say something that they couldn't otherwise say. Because these are exaggerated narratives uh, that you see on late night uh, comedy, um, news reports on the campaign can bring these narratives in. And so even if, for the people who are not watching late night comedy, the impact is pretty significant because it, there is a, a heavy, heavy emphasis on uh, the narrative of late night comedy within the coverage of the campaigns themselves. Um, one of the ways that you can, uh, as a reporter, uh, leave it to somebody else to say something that you wish you could say uh, is, to, uh, is to use late night comedy to say it. And so, um, and so when we think about this in the context of cancer culture, I think we've got a duality here. You know, you've got, um, you've got a variety of, of, of uh, opportunities to, to, to mock Donald Trump, who he is, what he says, what he does, the inconsistency, the gap between what he promises and what he delivers. All of these, of course, lead to, um, lead to comedy. But there's also um, the reality that he isn't going anywhere. And so, you know, cancel culture aside, I think the comics are glad that he's not president, but they also miss him while he's gone. Um, fortunately for them, he hasn't really gone. Um, and so with that, I will uh, we'll hand it back to, uh, to Serge. Well, uh, I would like to see if Farah would like to add anything to your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I, um, um, uh, I, I, I don't have anything to add to this particular presentation, but on side notes, we did some other um, comparative studies as well. And uh, there was a very clear sense if we did some um, uh, interviews and we found out that um, our participants found political comedy very cathartic um, and uh, particularly democratic leaning uh, participants, they found digesting food in humorous ways was the only way they could consume uh, Trump related information. Um, so again, and it does not really add to this study, this presentation, but uh, something that's always brewing in the back of my head, that, uh, that quantitative substance to this increased number of jokes and why people are 
uh, relying on political comedy to consume uh, uh, news. But thank you very much, Serge. Of course. Uh, thank you, Farah. Thank you, uh, Steve. So we will ask uh, questions uh, at the end of this panel. And uh, next we have uh, Ken Val from India joining us today on this beautiful, beautiful day. And she will talk about secular mobilization of masses. I guess mm -hmm. it's uh, in Indian context. Ken Val, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me over. Uh, well, uh, it's nice to see Farah. Uh, good evening, everybody. So my title is uh, Secular Mobilization of Masses. And I'm from uh, a college affiliated to Punjab University, Chandigarh, India. Now, uh, the difference in my presentation is that the character assassination and cancel culture in India this time is not against any elite, which usually used to happen. It is against this picture, which you are seeing, farmers. India is an agriculture country. And I'm very proud to say that I hail from a country in which, which boasts itself of being the world's largest democracy with the lengthiest constitution, 395 articles, 105 amendments, though we adopted our constitution only in 1950. Now, India is and has been an agriculture country, uh, agriculture-based country. And what you see over here is farmers. You can see the Muslims. You can see the Hindus, because Hindus usually do not wear, uh, except on festival occasion, they do not wear a headgear. And you see the six who are 2% of the minority. Now, in India, in every state, you have farmers who are tilling the land. The land holdings have decreased with the passage of time because of uh, division between the different sons and daughters of the family. Now, last year in June 2020, an ordinance was passed by the ruling BJP government in which a regional party of Punjab, an agriculture state, a border state, they passed an ordinance, three acts by which, which are popularly known as farm laws, which says that the government wanted to free the farmer from the clutches of the middlemen. So ordinance is usually passed under article 123 when the parliament is not in session. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind is that the regional political party, Shiromni Kalidal, which is a, a party of the ruler Jatsik peasantry, was an alliance part of, party with the party in power. So they said yes, they said yes to the, uh, to the ordinance, though they walked out of the uh, alliance later on. Now, what is the protest? The, uh, there are three laws, uh, you can read them at leisure. Uh, because I would like to go at the correct assassination stage. The bills were recently approved by the Lok Sabha, the lower house of the parliament on 17 September and by the upper house on September 20th, 2020. And the president of India gave his assent on September 24, 2020. As I said, the advocates say that the bills would deliver justice to millions of farmers. Our prime minister who's on a visit to your country, he calls it a watershed moment because the farmers will be delivered from injustice and so on. But there are the, the prime minister and the government of India are not uh, giving any statements against the farmers, but their supporters, their so-called supporters are character assassinating the farmers in a big way, which has led to a lot of problem, but it has also, and you'll be surprised that this character assassination has strengthened the movement. So these are the three acts, uh, the farmers produce trade and commerce, farmers agreement on uh, price assurance and the essential commodities act, right? Now it's more of economic, but what is the argument? The argument is the farmers feel that private players will hold products and later sell at a high price. 
the private buyers will buy the product from the farmer at a very low price. Entering into contract would lead to slavery. The redressal mechanism could fail, it's very weak. The farmer would be at the mercy of the big traders and business tycoons. They call it the tyranny of the markets. And the land holdings are so small, the produce is so small that farmers do not have enough, enough to sell and transport the small produce across different states. That would lead to an increase in cost of production. So this is where the protest comes in. Thus, the farmers have been protesting in nearly every city and towns in many parts of the country. They have been joined by people from every section of the society who feel that privatization could lead to food becoming very expensive. Well, we in India consider it a pleasure to feed every guest who comes your way because food, good quality food is not expensive. Many researchers are studying the movement as it is humongous in quantity with lakhs of farmers joining in. Young, the youth, women and children form a big part of the movement. The movement is being praised for being nonviolent and peaceful considering the numbers. Delhi is our capital and on all the sides, farmers are sitting huddled like this. These are tractors which have been converted into homes. And this is what they were doing in the winters. The farmers have stayed in these tractors through summers of last year, extreme winters, uh, again, summers, monsoon, and uh, they are still going on. And it's been more than, it's nearly been a year now. Now, uh, the farmers of Punjab were the first to protest and they, and they marched towards Delhi and they were joined by the farmers of the neighboring state Haryana. Haryana was carved into a separate state from Punjab in 1966. Though the states have a lot of issues between them, boundary, Chandigarh itself, Chandigarh is the capital of both Punjab and Haryana and water dispute also, but yet the farmers of Haryana extended full support to their brethren from Punjab. The, again, in Haryana, the government is of the ruling Bharati Janta Party, henceforth BJP. But still the farmers have come out in big numbers to support the farmers of Punjab. And as I go with my presentation, the movement slowly slipped away from the hands of the farmers of Punjab to Haryana and then to the Hindi heartland, where again the BJP, the ruling party, is in power. Now, this is a very uh, famous picture. This man is uh, Baba Lab Singh, and he sits in Chandigarh in a roundabout, a very famous roundabout. And whenever the administration has tried to remove him, students, lawyers, politicians, everybody, not all the politicians, the opposition party, but especially the young have run and they have freed him from the jail, from the prison, or refuse the administration to take him away from there. And every evening, there are scores of people standing here, waving flags uh, and uh, supporting them. So this man has been sitting here from one. Now, now we come to the, from one year. Now, here we come to the character assassination. Now, the farmers, when they moved to Punjab, uh, to the border of Delhi, they were called Khalistanis by a section of the leaders. This led to a wave of protest from all the sections of the society because Article 19 gives the Indian citizen freedom of speech expression and the freedom to protest peacefully. Now, Khalistan has touched a very raw nerve as the demand called for a separate state. Punjab had to suffer two decades of terrorism, 20 years of terrorism, because some people wanted a separate state a state to secede from the Indian Union, Khalistan, which means land of the pure. So the demand led to a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of bloodshed. So finally it was solved by again two Sikh, a Sikh politician and a Sikh policeman who brought normalcy to Punjab. So the people of Punjab do not want Punjab to secede from the Indian Union. So calling them Khalistanis was a big setback and the moment the farmers of Punjab were called Khalistanis. Farmers from Haryana, Rajasthan, the neighboring states, 
even from south india boarded trains started walking towards the delhi border that if you are calling our farmer brothers khalistanis we all are khalistanis and this is how the movement was strengthened and farmers hindu sikh muslim they all joined the protest now this is something very interesting on the left you have a lady who was featured in the times magazine farah is smiling she knows it bilkis banu we had a very controversial act last year citizen citizenship amendment act and there was a lot of protest in delhi and this lady on your left bilkis banu who's uh, you know called dadi dadi banu that's granny we call uh, dadi so she was she was sitting there throughout the winters protesting and she was named by the times of india uh, by the times as 100 most influential person and the lady on the right there is no resemblance she is mrs mahinder kaur and she has been sitting with the farmers in delhi now there is a very famous bollywood star who is a supporter of the ruling party kangana ranaut she got into a twitter war with the famous punjabi superstar diljeet dosanjh when she called the these old lady she mistook both the ladies to be one and she called them that these ladies this dadi can this granny is for hire and she can be hired for rupees 100 rupees that's nearly just 1 dollar of yours right which led to a big fight between a punjabi superstar because he said i consider as her as both of them as my mother and you better not speak against two innocent ladies so much so that uh, the twitter war was so much and diljeet dosanjh the punjabi superstar would just not give up that kangana ranaut had to delete all her twitter accounts right so this was a this was character assassination of two ladies who just wanted to protest using article 19 then farmers from as i have told you telangana rajasthan odisha west bengal jharkhand chatisgarh karnataka all of them started moving towards the uh, delhi borders and even two hindu bjp leaders from punjab mr manoranjan kali and mr surjit kumar jaini they are from the ruling party but they objected to the farmers being called separatists and they said we would take it up with the party high command a lot of politicians have come to the support of the farmers mostly they are from the opposition so some have criticized some have uh, helped uh, some have helped the farmers the farmers have been called they have been character assassinated by being called anti national urban nexalists the railway minister mr piyush goel said the farmers ranks have been infiltrated by maoist and leftists the farmers ranks it is alleged have been infiltrated by the agents of pakistan and china another union minister minakshi lekhi she is wife of an advocate called the farmers hooligans a remark for which she had to be had to apologize later there are others uh, mr pc chidambaram who was the former finance minister he called the people who are criticizing the farmers as tukre tukre gang which means group that breaks people which divides people so here you see women old young i myself um, visited the tikri border and i was amazed at the kind of discipline uh, everything which was being followed non violence and then the farmers uh, were joined by veterans from the defense forces and yesterday even the bank union has joined them in condemning the farm laws now here you have this doctor he's a cardiologist from usa dr swayman singh he has been staying in uh, at the borders from the past 10 months refusing to go back he's opened up a library he gives free treatment to the farmers free of cost and he is with them looking after them and rendering his services free of cost uh now the picture became very grim on the pious occasion of the republic day of india which is celebrated on january 26th every day and the farmers decided a month before they decided to take out a tractor rally to show their grievance to the government they had talks with the government uh with the administration of delhi which is again ruled by opposition party and uh all the path was charted out where from where they would enter which side they would enter and the rally was received by the people of delhi who lined up to receive the farmers with flowers the rally was peaceful and but 
uh, you know, around the red fort where you celebrate, where the, all the dignitaries are there, uh, there's so much of security that they say even a bird cannot get access to that. And suddenly, one group of farmers who had never been to Delhi, most of them had never been to Delhi, one group was guided towards the red fort, right? And that led to a lot of, a lot of uh, chaos. Now, this is the way the Delhi government had barricaded, trying to stop the farmers' entry into Delhi. These barricades were removed under intense criticism and by the interference of the judiciary, that you can't do this to your own people. They have full right to enter. This is the tractor rally. Uh, you can just see the amount. The people are coming. They're entering Delhi. They are peaceful. But suddenly, the problem happened when 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 a group of people just reached the the farmers were interviewed later they just didn't know they said the police kept guiding us and we kept reaching and we just kept driving on and suddenly they were at the red fort and one of the supporters of uh, who deep siddhu a very close friend of a sitting member of parliament motivated the youth to hoist the flag of the six on the ramparts of the Red Fort, challenging the very sovereignty of the Indian Union. It was later proved that by hundreds of witnesses that the rally, except this place, was peaceful everywhere. And uh, after this, after this protest, when the police, of course, uh, came out heavily on the uh, uh, on the young, uh, the farmer leaders apologized for the trouble, and they were disheartened and the movement started dying down. This is the Red Fort, it happened. You can see all the chaos, the mayhem. And the farmers were blamed, uh, farmers apologized and they started returning to their, to their uh, towns, villages, cities. Uh, Rakesh Tiket, I'll just show you his photograph. Rak Rakesh Tiket is son of a former leader, Mahindra Singh Tiket, who was a force in the 1980s. Now, Rakesh Tiket had fever that day and he was sitting in his tent when all this broke out and when the farmers started packing and started going home. He just wept being called terrorist and what, what farmers had done. They just lost the movement. And he pledged on the public media, social media, that I will not have a sip of water till I get water from my village, which is in Western Uttar Pradesh. And he appealed, and when he cried, the farmers who were returning home disheartened, heard his appeal and turned the tractors back and headed back to the protest site. So the movement passed from Punjab to Haryana and then to the Hindi heartland, where again, the ruling BJP is in power. But no one complained. This is Mr. Rakesh Tikad. He's crying. You can go on the YouTube and see how his tears and you know, brought back people. And this is what the farmers are doing now. This is known as the Mahapanchayat, the Great Council of Villages. They are having these, they are having this, these councils everywhere they, where they decide with consensus what they are going to, they, they are not settling anything less than complete repeal of the farm laws. So this is the kind of response the farmers are getting. And this is how they are, uh, you know, they are uh, protesting. Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs are eating, drinking, camping together. They refuse to be divided. You, as I told you, Delhi is being ruled by the Aam Admi Party. The farmers are being supported by the kith and kin settled in various countries. I think you are seeing the kind of protests which are happening in USA, Canada. And the protest is being studied by researchers across the country for being nonviolent and peaceful because we are the uh, land of Mahatma Gandhi. This is the protest which is happening in Canada, England, United Kingdom, USA. Now, lately, two weeks back, they, we have a small town, Karnal, again in Haryana, where a subdivisional magistrate, Mr. Ayush Sena, was caught on camera shouting orders to his policemen to break the heads of the protesting farmers if they try to break the barricade. He gave the orders because the chief minister of Haryana was holding a meeting nearby. The bureaucrat has since then been, been transferred. The pro farmers had just promised to bl wave black flags at the site of the meeting and that too at a safe distance. But the police later barricaded the entire site. When the farmers tried to jump the barricade, they were told, photo that break their heads. This is the, again, 
uh, the police is under scrutiny now. The judiciary is taking them to task. Now, this is very interesting. When the government of India is trying very hard uh, to talk with 32 farmer groups, there have been 12 rounds of talks which have failed, but both the parties, especially the government of India, is continuing the talks. Now, when one or two rounds failed initially, somebody correct assassinated the farmers by saying that they come here for free food just to have good food in a five-star hotel at the expense of government of India. Now, what do the farmers do? They carry their own food. They sit, they not, don't even use the furniture. They sit on the ground, on the floor, and they eat the food and even offer it to the government officials. That is the kind of dignity they are fighting for. They say, we will not, we are not coming here for free food. And uh, as I told you, the government of India is trying to solve the deadlock. There have been more than a dozen rounds of negotiations. Both sides are still ready for talks. The farmers have sat through the winters as well as the hot summers. They have faced the rains, the monsoon of 2021, sitting in the open. Many international and national celebrities have come to their support, Rihanna being one of them, Greta Thunberg being one of them. Around 500, rather the figure has gone up, more than 500 farmers have died during the protest. Farmers have been sitting for more than 200 days. The farmers, many political parties have tried to make the issue political. The farmers have refused to fight elections. Uh, they don't want to get political. Uh, there are protests in nearly every city and town of India. The Supreme Court of India has passed stay orders for the implementation of the farm laws, asking the former body, farmer bodies, which are 32, they have come together, as well as the government to carry out negotiations in the right spirit. So uh, this is my uh, presentation. And to conclude, what I can say is that the farmer protest, and yes, uh, yesterday, uh, two days back, one of the one of the uh, again one of the ruling party MPs uh, and the party the ruling party has distanced themselves uh, from the party. Now again, one of the uh, members has said that Mr. Narendra Modi is dealing very very uh, very lightly with the uh, he, that the person the minister himself. The BJP spokesman himself is from the ruling party, but he says that Narendra Modi is dealing with the with the farmers very uh, softly. Had he been Mr. Kalu, that's his name, had he says, if I had been in power, if I would have been the prime minister of India, I would have broken the heads of the farmers and put them into jail and 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 set them right. So, in what my presentation aims to convey is that this time, for the first time in India, the character assassination or the target group is not elite. We have a lot of character assassination, uh, mud slinging uh, between uh, political leaders, the opposition, ruling party, uh, the novio rich, etc. But it is first time that the protest, the, the mud slinging, the target has been a very, very big group. 70% of the people are still engaged in agriculture in India. And Punjab, Haryana, they contribute maximum to the food bowl, as well as to the army, navy, especially to the army. So these are the states which keep the country safe as well as well fed. And what are the farmers saying? They're just saying, we, we listen to us. We are protesting for something. We, are, we have left our home and hearth for more than 10 months. Now it's nearly a year. You have to listen to us. We don't, democracy is rule of majority. We don't want these laws. We are happy with the old system. But it, it, there are a lot of, um, there, there is, uh, they have been called hooligans. They have been beaten up. Uh, they have been barricaded. Uh, 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 they are. Uh, they are. Uh, the, the farmers are so good. Whatever rivalry they had, they are telling each other's fields because it's a voluntary act, and people are coming by turns from the villages, getting things, goods in in tractors, in their trucks. There's a lot of voluntary service. 
I know people who go once a week and go and spend a lot of money and they fill up the uh, ration with the, all the essential commodities. But uh, there's some miscommunication between the government of India and the farmers and uh, between uh, the, the prime minister, home minister, nobody's uttering a word. They just want the talks to go on, go on. But it is the other people who are jumping into the bandwagon and calling the farmers, protesting farmers who, who are disciplined, who are feed, they are feeding the people of neighboring uh, localities. Um, they are migrant laborers from Bihar, other states. They are very happy that the, that the farmers have come and they have been eating full meal for the past one year. Uh, and uh, uh, they are, uh, the, uh, the uh, farmers want to be heard uh, because they say Article 19 means freedom of speech and expression and freedom to assemble peacefully without arms. And they are doing that, but uh, there are people, middlemen, who are calling them, as I told you, hooligans who want to break their heads, who are calling them terrorists, who are calling them secessionists, who are calling them Nexalites. Nexalite, uh, again, is a movement which is there in all the uh, states where there's a lot of unemployment. So uh, uh, the middle, middle class, uh, young boys and girls, uh, because there are online classes going on, uh, I have students who sit, who tell me that, ma'am, I'm not going to switch on my video because I'm at the protest site and I'm attending my classes. So it is amazing to see the discipline, the selfless service, uh, because I myself visited there. I had to make the trip, but uh, the farmers are being targeted by some media personalities. Uh, they, they, have, they have boycotted the media because they call it Godi media after Modi media that the media is not, uh, but the media is not, uh, you know, uh, reporting, but every child, every farmer has a smartphone in hand. So we get all the news from there directly and nothing can be hidden. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kenval. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, colleagues, I don't see Philip or Jenny uh, uh, here online with us. So I assume they didn't have a chance or could not connect. So that's why we have a shorter panel. Uh, however, uh, it's good news because we have more time for Q&A and feel free to post your questions for uh, our presenters. Uh, I see actually Bob Lichter joining us on and off online. So Bob, if you uh, listen to us, please feel free to jump in and uh, answer some of these questions. So let's start um, uh, with questions for Steve and Farah and the rest of the team. Uh, my first question is actually linked to our uh, yesterday's presentation uh, uh, from two Italian scholars about populism in Europe. And um, what is interesting to me about what you are uh, presenting today about political humor in the US, it looks like the uh, populists like Donald Trump uh, are well kind of, um, you know, fit into this current media model where character assassination proliferates simply because they produce a lot of clickbait and therefore they're very welcome uh, for, for, for media corporations who actually encourage this kind of uh, character attacks and uh, negative rhetoric used online. So the, the question is, uh, do you think that there is anything can be done in order for uh, this level of uh, incivility and political populism to ever go down if it's basically uh, has become a structural issue now? Well, I'll, uh, I'll say a couple of quick things and we can uh, turn it over to Farah and, and Bob if they would like to add. M my impression is that uh, people are getting what they want. These are for-profit media in the United States. They uh, provide the con content that people will tune into and, uh, and it's really useful. Uh, one uh, thing that I didn't mention before about Donald Trump is that in many ways, there is a dynamic here that is um, that, that, that in some ways that Trump is kind of a comedian himself. I mean, he's a, an insult comic, if you will. Um, he uh, always finds compelling monikers to apply to uh, the people who run against him. They're sleepy or they're creepy or they're low energy. Um, and so across um, Trump's world of reality TV, uh, he has really created an environment that is uh, that is exceptionally 
connected to late night comedy. Um, in a way, that's part of the reason why I think um, they have been so effective at mocking him because he's already in their universe, if you will. Um, but I do think that, that Trump is kind of one off. If you think about the Trump wannabes on the Republican side, um, I don't see the kind of media skills that Trump possesses in the governor of Florida or the governor of Texas or Mike Pence or uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo. Uh, they all seem like rather uh, pale two dimensional versions of the Trump movement to me, um, which means that they might not be as effective at fighting back. Um, might not be as effective at using th those kinds of skills in cancel culture to cancel the people who would cancel them. Um, and, uh, and like I said, I'll, I'll hand it off to Farah if she has any other thoughts. Uh, right. So, so here is a um, uh, follow-up question to you, and then I will ask a question to Farah. Uh, so if we think of Trump as a, a, his own media and thinking about his second arrival, which is very real, so, so what are the chances of him to basically bypass Fox News and other uh, conservative media and establish his own channel, which will be extremely popular, extremely supported, and he will have lots and lots of uh, clickbait, uh, which will be again uh, promoted by the same liberal media who uh, basically benefited for, from what we call the Trump bump, who made a fortune during the Trump's presidency, because it's greatly benefited all liberal media in this country. Well, I, I think Trump will will never really build his own media operation. He's going to piggyback on others. Uh, and if Fox News isn't supportive enough, there's always Newsmax or uh, Newsmax or One America News Network. And so I, I can't imagine that Trump will ever actually execute a plan for a media operation of his own, uh, but rather he would have people for that. Um, and uh, and that is, you know, the I think the vehicle. But it's not clear that those vehicles are going to be as effective. I mean, one of the painful realities that Trump has been facing, at least painful from the perspective of Trump himself, is the ban on Twitter and the ban on Facebook and those uh, efforts that he has has tried to use through underlings to sort of put his message out there hasn't been nearly as effective. Um, and so it, it's clear um, that the you know that I think that within the Trump movement, the apple may be falling some distance from the tree, so to speak. And that's a potential problem. Uh, the biggest problem for Trump though, isn't, isn't cancel culture as it relates to political humor, uh, but cancel culture as it relates to the US Justice Department and the Attorney General of New York State and some of these other figures that would, uh, with depositions and trials and other matters, uh, create an environment that, uh, that would be very, very unfavorable in terms of the narrative for the former president. So. Um, so if you if you think political humor is going to save the country, um, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm giving the floor to Farah and Bob if he's here. I would say um, what Trump represents in political comedy is the oxymoron of cancel culture. Um, political comedy can build up a politician, a candidate. Uh, they can uh, destroy one. Trumps represent one where comedians want to build him up enough so they can bash him, destroy him, and then build him up just enough so they can destroy him. So, search again what you were talking about, Trump, um, just to use him enough for their own personal benefit to improve their. Uh, quality of uh, comedy or their influence in how we see news and how we perceive American politics. Um, but to me, Trump uh, truly just represents that oxymoron that exists everywhere. And, and he is one for um, cancel culture. Uh, Bob? Yes. Uh, okay. It looks like I'm actually getting through to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to, to do some historical perspective, which is that when we started this back in the 1990s, there were a couple of shows that got tens of millions of viewers uh, because there were viewers for a small number of programs. Now, the vast expansion of opportunities to see whatever you want uh, means that it's possible for the late night shows to make money uh, without having the huge audiences they did before which also means it's, it's perfectly acceptable to them to continue doing all Trump all the time 
in terms of the, uh, the financial opportunities. Uh, what it also means though, is that uh, their audience may become more skewed to people who agree with them politically. And this, this uh, happened with Comedy Central. Uh, the shows there had uh, very heavily uh, liberal audiences. Uh, and what that means is there's probably less opportunity to change people's uh, ideas because the people who are changeable are not watching these shows. The people who are egging them on uh, are simply uh, ensuring that, uh, that they feel more strongly in attitudes that they, uh, that they already have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so Dr. Cohen. Uh, my question is a little bit about the, uh, you had mentioned, Farah, a qualitative study that goes along with the, the quantitative study about um, the late night political humor. And you mentioned people, you know, feeling political humor to be cathartic. And I have to say, that's an impulse I totally understand and like resonates with my news consumption during the past little while here in the United States. But so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about um, what types of qualitative data you gathered and what questions you asked your interviewees and what other things that you learned from doing that? Um, so kind of giving you a little meta analysis of um, how it started. Um, so the person who was there before me collecting data had to discontinue because she just could not take it anymore and it was giving her anxiety to collect this data and um so with that in mind uh it was for a class project i went into this notion that maybe um we like to consume political news through comedy because it's a little more cathartic. We can listen to what uh, Trump did when it's a little watered down, when we can uh, maybe have this feeling of um, uh, someone acknowledging how absurd some of these news items are and how out of line they may be. And um, so we uh, did focus groups. We conducted three focus groups with um, undergraduate and graduate students. And um, we asked them different questions, never using the word catharsis, but it came up at least once in each focus group. Uh, which was interesting. So that kind of gave us a little clue into, okay, this, this, this thing is real. It's actually happening. Um, and uh, basically a lot of uh, what um, Dr. Ferns had already talked about, um, young people consuming political news, because it's it's just the right amount of seriousness for them, and there is a lot enough context for them to be interested. Some students also talked about how they wrote their term paper on on some issue because they learned about it from some comedic show. Um, so, uh, it, and again, they they delved into how or when they are compelled to share those news clips. So most of them are not sitting down in front of a television watching these shows at night, but rather going back through social media and re-watching. A lot of them are also consuming them in small clips as well. Um, mostly just political clips shared and reshared through through their social networks. Um, did I miss any part of your question? Okay, good. Uh, excellent. Uh, so there is a question from Anna Kluiv. Uh, um, curious if you coded on the humorous discussions of politicians from the late night shows. Late night hosts often uh, offer very serious discussions of political issues, particularly St uh, Stephen Colbert or uh, Trevor. Noah, uh, and uh, so when uh, it's like actually a follow-up question. So when you code humor, how do you know if it's humorous? 
I don't know who uh, will handle that question, maybe Steve or uh, Tara. Um, I can go ahead and take a stab at it. Um, when we code for humor, we look for elements of sarcasm. Um, we look for pauses. We look for uh, applause from the audience. Uh, there, a lot of times it's very difficult to uh, distinguish between just hardcore going after someone just to sting or humor. Um, so there is a fine line that we have to determine. It takes a little bit of practice um, and it takes a little bit of revisiting um, and, and basically looking for our own biases, right? As I mentioned the word cathartic, like coding this data was cathartic for me as well because I find some uh, sense of relief and trunk Trump being made fun of in this way. Um, and that's just my politics. I was going into it very well aware of my biases. So going back and revisiting and um, uh, being in the moment of whether I find it funny and amusing or is it really a political joke that was meant as a joke. So uh, a lot of self-reflection. Uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, Leslie, do you want to ask a question here? Well, yes, I, I was wondering, I, I'm interested in your coding method and uh, these types of humor and do these people even know they're being funny sometimes and how would you code that if they don't seem to know? Um, but I'm wondering if you think that your method might work on some of these alternative uh, news sources such as Reddit or 4chan where people are really getting down and dirty with what they really think and want to disseminate to others. Um, so again, I'll take a first stab at this question. Um, we are not coding material that's not intended to be funny. So again, uh, that's where we um, use a lot of just self-reflection and, and just looking at information that is um, meant to be funny. So uh, the good thing is with a lot of these jokes, um, comedians, intend to be funny and it's easy to to figure that out um, that that distinction was a little more clear when we were coding for COVID related jokes um, where a lot of comedians had um, took on their platforms to um, to to um, use their platform as, as a public service of announcements about uh, disinformation about uh, COVID, right? So that's where uh, that distinction was a little more clear. But again, we were looking at those uh, uh, cues and clues, whether something was intended to be a joke or not intended to be a joke. So there was, in those particular circumstances, there were sarcasm about how um, COVID information was handled or mishandled. And um, they, in those cases, the intent was not to make a joke, but rather to provide clarity about what was in fact correct in how the White House handled those jokes and what was not correct, or uh, in other words, CDC approved. Um, so uh, for, for majority of our political jokes, uh, deciphering whether something is a joke or not a joke is not that um, uh, relevant because almost everything they say int is intended to be a joke and is therefore a joke. And let, let me add to that, that uh, lengthy political diatribes are rare. Uh, the audience is expecting something light. They're happy to hear jokes uh, at the expense of the politicians they don't like. 
but uh, a host who simply stood there and went on and on about uh, his views on the issues of the day would quickly start to lose audience, I think. Uh, and, and incidentally, one thing that is happening now for the first time, uh, we've been going back to the 1990s, finding that you have uh, Democrats uh, joked about less than uh, Republicans, at least uh, in the context of, of campaign news. And one question has always been, why isn't there a conservative uh, talk show like this? And finally, uh, Fox News has put on somebody, Greg Gutfeld, uh, who is quite competitive. So uh, I think you're going to have an opportunity to see a battle of policy prescriptions now that, uh, that Fox has gotten into uh, the business. And it'll be interesting to see how, how this either pulls away um, audiences from the traditional shows uh, or brings in new audiences that haven't been exposed to this material. So that's something we're going to be watching for in the future. Uh, thank you, Bob. I always wanted uh, Larry the Cable Guy or uh, Jeff Foxworth <laughs> to have their own uh, political shows. I would watch that. Uh, so, Ken Val, uh, I have a question for you about your presentation. It was fascinating, and uh, we had a lot of um, emotional images right there. Uh, so it looks like political activism is on the rise in India, and it... So, uh, and we see how politicians and government use actual character assassination directed at the opposition leaders. Uh, tell me, uh, what is the defamation uh, legislation in India about using character attacks in, uh, in the media? So does it prevent uh, certain people use some of these attacks or it's wide open and it's just like wild west? Um, yeah. Yes, uh, for your first question, yes, I'm pleasantly surprised uh, that political activism is on the rise, right? Uh, young boys and girls, and uh, uh, if you could go sometime and on, see on YouTube how people oppose the CAA bill, CCA Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, women were sitting on the roads in winters in Delhi for four months, right? And uh, so it's women, children, uh, everybody is into political activism. And yes, the uh, character assassination, uh, character assassination is rampant in India. You know, uh, when I tell people that I'm into this field of study, they say, oh God, it's nothing. It's so common but it's not studied at all. And I think Farah being from, uh, you know, this side of the world can vouch for it that we character assassinate every day, but it's just not taken as an academic field of study. And yes, uh, uh, well, the government is passing laws where you cannot go against the security of the country, but again, people are, people are opposing it. Uh, uh, the, there was uh, there were some uh, rumors floating that your WhatsApp messages, etc. The social media uh, will be uh, tagged, and you can be punished if anything goes against the uh, sovereignty of the country. Uh, but uh, but uh, yes, the uh, defense, uh, all the uh, officers, soldiers have been told to go uh, off social media about six months back from now. Uh, but I'm still pleasantly surprised that. Uh, despite so much of uh, scrutiny of uh, our accounts and all, young boys and girls who have to go in for a government job, in India, we still look forward to a government job. It means security for a long time. So, um, uh, but I, I have to tell my students that please be careful what you write on WhatsApp because it can be used against you, but they are not giving up. They say, ma'am, we have to speak. We will, go, we will not go in for a government job. We'll go for a private job. Uh, we will eat less. We will uh, buy a smaller car but we have to oppose. So yes, political activism is coming, uh, coming and uh, yes, the government is heavily coming down. Uh, a few uh, of the government are coming heavily down on the critics, but yes, criticism, political activism prevails. 
and not only here tomorrow tomorrow india is going to be closed the whole of india uh, is going to be closed tomorrow i just got a message it's going to be a bharat band it's going to be the farmers bank union professors we people we have all aligned and tomorrow we are working from home uh, because it's complete uh, uh, ban uh, you know the whole of india is closed for tomorrow so uh, despite all the uh, efforts by the government criticism is growing and uh, the indian diaspora is really contributing to it uh, dr preet i know you working on the book uh, on uh, character assassination in india which will be used as a textbook in colleges so hopefully we can uh, collaborate in the future and uh, we will be happy to share our syllabus and uh, our um, uh, uh, our chapters for you and please keep us posted about your uh, scholarship. So uh, Dr. Kohane. I wanted to ask one more quick question before we uh, move to our last panel for the day. And it's, you know, most of us um, are probably hearing about a lot of these protests for the first time for those of us that live in sort of our Western bubble um, where we don't get a lot of international news even if we do actively consume news. But we were mentioning in the chat just how powerful these images that you were showing are of people gathering together. And I was struck by your statement that the farmers are bypassing media and instead using smartphones to get their messages out. But so I'm curious how these, these powerful images are circulating through India, if they're being printed in major papers or if you have to look for them farther afield. And if you would say they're doing a good job at um, inspiring identification with the farmers. Yeah, uh, I have to. I have to be uh, constant in touch with my journalist friends because they have certain media. Uh, I, I, they have certain pictures which are not put on the net, so I have to take it from them. Uh, thankfully, uh, I have a few journalists who are who are following these. They're sitting at the border. Of course, I go. I put all these sources, and I have to uh, take a lot of time to uh, get these images and. Uh, uh, I have not put certain images because uh, they were they were too uh, they were very emotional, you know. So um, you can look them up on the net. Just do the farmers' protest. Uh, they have been sitting in knee deep water, um, and if you go there, there's a library. The farmers' children are with them. They go and sit in the library. You know, people have donated books, and. Uh, I depend a lot on my journalist friends for the feedback. As I told you, I, I made a trip. I stayed on January 20th. I was there for the whole day. My friends visit. I get the photographs from them also. And of course, in Chandigarh, uh, we have protests going on. We have protests going on in Punjab. Uh, you will find a lone uh, person standing at a roundabout waving a flag. And all you have to do is, you know, you honk your car on and you show your support. So we do it all the time. I know it causes a little bit of noise pollution, but uh, but if you see the farmers, the way they're living, uh, the day, you know, the, the way they serve you food, it's, it's a village come together. And uh, I don't know how many of you know the hookah, you know, the Haryana people have hookah, the six don't uh, smoke, but they're sitting there with their hookahs and it's like home for them. The women are churning out food, uh, fresh food, which is so delicious. I swear, I've never had such delicious food. You know, and, and nobody can, it's, and they stop you, they feed you. My sons were actually, you know, they had food thrust into them. They were saying, we can't have so much food, but they were saying, no, no, you're you looking very thin. You better have more food. That love, that non-violence, and yes, they have just boycotted the, uh, the media. They don't let journalists enter. They don't let journalists, you have, I mean, the kind of angst, hatred, anger uh, at the media, I have never seen it before. And there are very few channels showing it, but there are a lot of channels. And yes, there are uh, young boys and girls. Uh, uh, you know, we are a very conservative society. Uh, unmarried girls are not allowed out of the homes without parental consent. But there are girls sitting there and they're very safe. They're very safe. The parents have said, yes, just go. And uh, there's, there is a, there is an image that, uh, you know, young boys and girls of Punjab and Haryana into drugs. I have seen boys and girls work like crazy. They are, they are cleaning roads. They are cleaning the neighborhood. They have built small ponds. They have planted trees. 
and the there are two hotel owners who have gone bankrupt feeding food to the farmers anybody <laughs> over there Dr. Kendall, thank you. Thank you again for being with us today. Uh, my friends, let me uh, finish this panel and pass the baton to uh, Dr. Cohen, who will chair the next uh, session.